You're watching InfoSec Bytes, a crash course in information security for journalists. We're based at the Centre for Investigative Journalism in London and supported by the Logan Foundation. This video is part two of our introduction to PGP. This video is provided for information only. It cannot replace the advice of a trained security professional. If lives or safety depend on your security, please seek the advice of an expert. The Centre for Investigative Journalism is a pioneer in providing expert information security training services to journalists and journalistic institutions. To consult with an expert through the CIJ, or to arrange a CIJ training session, contact the address on screen. The tutorial you are about to watch is part of a series on PGP. If you haven't seen the others, click or tap on the pop-up message to access the playlist. In the last video, we explained symmetric encryption and public key encryption. As we saw, with symmetric encryption, the same key was used to encrypt and to decrypt. So a plain text is encrypted using an encryption key and it becomes a cipher text. The cipher text is then sent and it is unreadable if it is intercepted. Once it reaches its recipient, it is decrypted using the same encryption key, converted back to a plain text and then read. As we saw, public key encryption, otherwise known as asymmetric encryption, was invented to address some of the problems with symmetric encryption. Public key encryption uses two keys, a key pair, one of them public and the other one secret. Everyone gets a key pair, and they use the keys to communicate with each other. All of this might seem a bit confusing, and since PGP is public key encryption, this makes PGP confusing too. So, to make everything clearer, we're going to look closely at how people communicate using PGP. We're going to start with John. John has a key pair, a secret key and a public key. His public key can be copied as many times as he wants, so that he can distribute it to everyone he wants to communicate with. Let's say John gives his public key to Sam and Sam adds it to her collection of keys, her key ring. This means that Sam will now have an encryption path back to John. She would begin by encrypting with John's public key, send the encrypted message, and then John could decrypt the message with his secret key. But this encryption path is just one way. Even though Sam can send encrypted messages to John, John cannot yet send them to Sam because John doesn't have Sam's public key. To securely communicate in both directions, both parties have to have the other's key. They have to exchange their keys. Let's say Sam now sends John her public key, and John adds that to his key ring. Now, both parties have encryption paths to each other. John can send encrypted messages to Sam through Sam's public key, and Sam can send encrypted messages to John through his public key. Let's look at everything in sequence. John types up a secret message. He then uses Sam's public key to encrypt the message, and it emerges as a cipher text, ready to send. He now sends the message. Anyone who intercepts this message while it is in transit will be unable to read it. All they will see is undecipherable code. Sam now receives the message. She uses her secret key to decrypt the message and is then able to read the message in plain text. She wants to reply, so she writes another message for John. She then uses John's public key to encrypt that message and it becomes a cipher text. She sends the message to John and once John receives it, he decrypts it using his secret key and is then able to read it. And this process can be repeated for an entire conversation. Public key encryption isn't just between two parties. John can send his public key to as many contacts as he wants, enabling them to send him encrypted messages. But specifically sending your public key to each contact is also very repetitive and can take a lot of time. So John may wish instead to publish his public key to make it available in public, so that anyone who wants to communicate with him can just take a copy of his public key. On the internet, 
This is done with what is called a key server, a special online directory of all the public keys. Instead of sending to each contact, John can send his public key to the key server. Likewise, each of these contacts can send their public keys to the key server. Now, when John wants to communicate with those contacts, he just downloads their public keys from the key server. And likewise, each of those contacts can download everyone else's public key, including John's, from the key server. Now, any one of these parties can send encrypted messages to any other. So that's a basic summary of how public key encryption, and in particular PGP, works. In part three of our introduction to PGP, we're going to look at why PGP became the popular standard for public key encryption. And we're also going to look at the best ways to use PGP. To watch it, click or tap on the pop-up message and find it in the menu. Thanks for watching InfoSec Bytes. If you found this video useful, please share it widely with your colleagues and co-workers. To support the Center for Investigative Journalism with a donation, please visit tcij.org forward slash donate. And if you would like to watch our other videos, please go to infosecbytes.org or subscribe to our channel below.